Hello and welcome to Bounding in the Comics. My name is John Trent. I'm the founder and editor-in-chief at Bounding in the Comics. Today we're going to talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi Part 4 or Episode 4. I'm not really sure why it is the show is even called Obi-Wan Kenobi anymore. This episode should specifically be called The Tala, the Tala Show because that is exactly what it was. It was a show about Tala saving the day, lecturing uh, Imperial officers, just being a Wonder Woman. Um, so let's kind of get into this. I wrote this article up earlier today uh, where I kind of break down the entire episode and provide my opinions, analysis, and critiques. So as you can tell, I titled the, <laughs> the article, Obi-Wan Kenobi Episode 4 is the Tala Show. And I, again, I believe that is exactly what it is. So uh, before we kind of break it down uh, bit by bit, and there's going to be massive spoilers, so if you're not looking for spoilers, I suggest you uh, find another video on the channel to watch. But here's kind of my brief overall view of this episode. It's an improvement from the previous episode. How can it not be? The previous episode was an absolute abomination, complete destruction of uh, Kenobi's character and uh, Star Wars in general. Uh, in fact, the first three episodes were kind of uh, building up to that third episode of, of just basically rewriting the history of the original Star Wars film. Uh, but this episode still struggles with in-episode and in-show continuity. It's been a problem for all of the Disney Plus Star Wars shows, including The Mandalorian and The Book of Boba Fett, in my opinion. And we see it here again. Uh, there's just it's just too uh, there's too many. I mean, simple questions should have been asked uh, by Joby Harold. Uh, I don't, I can't, I don't can't remember who the other writer was in this. I know Harold uh, did was right, had writing credits on it, but just simple questions should have been asked that were not asked. Uh, basic plot details don't make any sense, and the overall believability of it uh, doesn't really work either. There's too many uh, things in this episode where you have to suspend your disbelief and say, "Yeah, I, I I can accept that." And when you when you get to like the fifth <laughs> the fifth one, you're just like, "Well, this show really doesn't know what it's doing," or this episode doesn't really know what it's doing. But so let's get into the let's get a let's get into the breakdown here. The show begins with Tala and Kenobi on a ship headed to Jabim. Uh, one, one has to suspend again. <laughs> here we go. One has to suspend your disbelief and believe the two made it off Mapuzo, despite the Empire shutting down all the spaceports and Riva killing their pilot who is supposed to smuggle them off the planet. Doesn't explain how they got off the planet. You just have to accept it that they did, and she was able to get off somehow. Uh, I guess. There's a brief piece of dialogue later on in the episode where Reva questions Tala about how she, um, about how like Kenobi might have gotten off the planet, and uh, basically implying that she did it through her Imperial officer uh, connection. So maybe that's what they're implying uh, that she was able to get off planet because she is an Imperial officer. Regardless, uh, we don't really actually see how they get off. Uh, they just do remember the port was supposed to be locked down and their pilot who was supposed to smuggle them off was killed in the last episode. So after arriving on Jabim, Kenobi is placed in a back to tank to heal from his wounds suffered in the battle against Darth Vader. Show attempts to reinforce the bonds between Kenobi and Vader as it flashes between the two. Uh, to me, this felt like a cheap attempt to capture the emotion that Luke felt when he hacked Vader's hand off in Return of the Jedi. Uh, just, I don't know. It's just, just more tormenting Kenobi. I, I've spoke on this before. I just don't buy any of this characterization. I, I just think it's completely uh, devoid of any understanding of Star Wars. And the fact that they're putting it in here, I get, to me, shows that the people at Lucasfilm really don't have any idea what they're doing as far as uh, overall continuity. And then even if you look at this episode <laughs> as a standalone, they don't really know what they're doing uh, as far as just basic plot structure and plot continuity within the episode, which we'll get to. So... Kenobi quickly recovers from his injuries and attempts to recruit the those who are harboring him uh, from the Empire into a rescue mission to save Leia. Uh, what's interesting uh, is the show characterizes Kenobi as clueless about what's happening in the galaxy, just by clearly seeing the Inquisitor's brutality on Tatooine in the first episode, being tasked with rescuing Leia from them uh, at the end of the first episode, and then uh, participating in that rescue in the second episode. Uh, the entire second half of Revenge of the Sith, he literally sees the Empire summarily executing all the Jedi through Order 66. He's literally, uh, he literally goes to the Jedi Temple to re, uh, rejigger the uh, communication that's trying to lure Jedi to Coruscant, where they can like kill them. 
uh, and he has to he 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 rejiggers that, and then uh, the fact that the entire uh, Republic has been turned into the Empire and is controlled by the Sith Lord Darth Sidious. So even if it's been ten years, he clearly knows um, how terrible it is out there for people who are probably not a lot in line with uh, the the goals of the Sith and the Empire. But not only do they paint him as clueless, but he lacks any empathy for those harboring him, telling the leader of the group, Roken, played by O'Shea Jackson Jr., you have no idea what the Empire is capable of. Like, this guy who's literally smuggling him doesn't have any idea what the Empire is capable of. This guy giving him safe harbor, who's part of this path that he learned about last episode, has no idea what the Empire is capable of. It, he's it's treating Kenobi like he's an idiot, too. I mean, he's completely stupid, uh, to, to kind of even utter these lines. Uh, and then again, he doesn't have any empathy for them either, which Kenobi would as a Jedi. Uh, the response to Kenobi's statement is solidly delivered by uh, O'Shea Jackson Jr., uh, who discusses his Force-sensitive wife and the Inquisitors discovering her, uh, but it does hammer home just how little empathy Kenobi has for those who saved him. Uh, I'm sure there's probably issues people will have with uh, his wife being Force-sensitive, uh, I don't think there's that big of an issue with that because I think there were force sensitive people out there in the galaxy. They just weren't re- like trained and they really couldn't do a lot with that without the training as George Lucas made abundantly clear. And as he kind of showed us in uh, the prequel trilogy and even kind of discussed it about Luke having to undergo uh, training and he's too old and stuff like that. Because in order to actually master the force, you have to put in the time and training, sacrifice and effort, just like um, just like you see any kind of like Olympic athlete has to basically uh, that's all they're committed to is is that sport that they are uh, attempting to become the best at. Uh, Kenobi and Tala eventually convince Roken to help him rescue Leia, given she knows about their location on Jabim, as well as how the path operated on Mapuzo. However, his help also apparently involves knowing exactly where the Empire have taken Leia. Again, this is where another moment of many where you have to suspend your disbelief to bind the plot. So how does do they know that that's where Leia is? There's a brief mention of intelligence, and I guess you have to kind of assume that they have intelligence, that that's where they took Leia, uh, instead of maybe the <laughs> numerous other uh, bases or facilities where they could have taken her. Um, but this is where they tell us uh, where she is located. Uh, and that intelligence they mention is is mainly towards the whereabouts of Vader, that he's actually not on this planet. He's in a ship somewhere. Uh, but apparently they also know where uh, Leia was taken and that she was taken by Reva and the Inquisitors, which again goes to this idea of like, well, how does Vader not even know about who this person is and like kind of like connect the dots? He seems to just be kind of very at a distance instead of hands on which you would think he would be very hands-on given the fact that last episode he was literally on the planet hands-on. But again, in this episode, he decides to take a backseat and let Reva kind of do all the stuff. And the other two Inquisitors aren't even there either. They show up at the very end of this episode, which we'll get to. So again, uh, things that just don't really make sense, even from their own show's (laughs) continuity and how they've portrayed uh, these characters. Outside of anything outside of the show, like the Star Wars continuity overall, which we know from the first three episodes, they just don't really care about at all. Um, so I point out here, for all Obi-Wan and Tala know, Leia might not have even been captured by the Empire, and she could be home safely on Alderaan, convincing the pilot she was supposed to rendezvous with to go there instead of Jabim. I mean, remember, this is the little girl who's pretty much been getting her way. Uh, she's hopping on uh, space trucks, going to ports. Like, she's able to convince people of things. So why wouldn't she be able to get get to uh, Alderaan? Uh, I, I guess that's something you have to assume again that uh, Tala found out before she left the planet that Leia was captured. But again, they don't really actually show us that or even uh, tell us that in any bit of dialogue, I guess, other than the fact that like this part here where they're like, this is where she's been captured. Um, nevertheless, it's revealed that Leia is being held on a planet called Nur, a moon in the Mustafar system. Uh, at a base called Fortress Inquisitorius. Uh, They have little intel about the base, and it's made apparent they don't even know how far deep underwater the facility goes or what the layout is. Uh, So uh, Nur is a water planet, and this building comes up from the bottom of the ocean of the planet. 
Kenobi suggests an attack run using T-47 speeders. Uh, this is just an absolutely utter ridiculous suggestion that Obi-Wan Kenobi would never make because he's not dumb enough to suggest this. Uh, and as O'Shea Jackson's character points out, uh, that that would be a suicide mission because it is an Imperial base full of Imperial <laughs> troopers and the headquarters of the Inquisitors. You would think that they have probably a garrison there of stormtroopers. But uh, nevertheless, Kenobi decides to suggest that. Uh, and then you have a female character named Sully informs them that the T-47 speeders are used for hauling and not actually used for any kind of combat missions. Finally, Tala suggests infiltrating the base using her Imperial clearance, um, albeit they don't, she doesn't explain how they're managing to get Kenobi inside or like what the actual plan is. So I'm going to kind of pause going over the recap here and point out like the whole premise of this show or this episode is like a Mission Impossible episode, rescue mission, got to go uh, rescue Leia through the go, infiltrate this building that's like heavily guarded except in a mission impossible mission you they actually like are literally usually have a plan um to figure out what they need to do uh and they tell you painstakingly what they need to do and what the risks are involved and if they don't get it done uh what happens and then um usually when the plan is being enacted there's like a lot of tension i, I remember just from the first film uh, there's the scene where the guy actually does get into the room where he's supposed to be using the restroom. So they got to like plan for that. And he's like hanging above him and hoping he doesn't look up. Uh, so you do have things like that. Whereas like this episode does not tell you what the plan is whatsoever. doesn't give you any information about that. Uh, and just accepts you to like, just wants you to accept everything that happens um, as is and not really ask any questions um, or like, you just have to accept it, consume and accept. And that's what they expect you to do. Whereas, like, even with the most recent Top Gun uh, Maverick film, like, they tell you what the plan is. This is how you have to do it. They train for that. They're unable to get it. Maverick eventually is able to to make the run, showing that it can be done. And then he they have to actually execute the mission. And, like, things happen uh, during the mission that they have to kind of overcome. Uh, but at least you have an idea of what the mission is. Um, not only do the pilots have that idea, but the audience watching that has it as well. Whereas this, we have no idea what the mission is uh, or how it's going to be enacted. You you know the mission is to rescue Leia, but you don't know like what they're going to do, where she... like They don't know anything about this at all. It's just kind of like flying by the seat of their pants. And honestly, uh, they should have been easily just wiped out immediately and, th and their plan foiled because they didn't even actually do any kind of planning whatsoever. So... With that a uh, little bit out of the way, uh, as Kenobi and Tal are recovering and planning to rescue Leia, the Princess of Alderaan is uh, being interrogated by Reva uh, about the path, uh, the first two opening scenes of this interrogation. So it like, kind of jumps back and forth between Obi-Wan and Tala and then Leia being interrogated. The first two opening scenes of this interrogation are utterly ridiculous, are utterly ridiculous and don't make any sense given we know Reva has a mind-suck force ability that she used on... Haja Estri back in episode two. She doesn't use this in the first two scenes we see. She finally does, by the third interrogation scene, use the ability, but apparently it doesn't work because Leia is strong with the Force. Uh, however, Reva didn't even need to use her mind suck ability to read Kenobi's mind in the second episode. Remember when she uh, realizes that Kenobi didn't know that... Um, uh, Vader was still alive, even though that's made abundantly clear that he knows he's alive in Return of the Jedi, because he tells Luke the reason why Luke and Leia were separated was to keep them from their father. So he knew uh, they were alive then, uh, which the show just completely retcons. But uh, it also shows that Leia, who has no training with the Force, is somehow stronger than Kenobi. Uh, it's utterly, utterly ridiculous. Uh, just another moment where they're just trying to put Kenobi down and, and just beat him down. Uh, and they do it by showing like how strong Leia is, uh, <laughs> because, because it is it's putting down Kenobi where like Reva was able to read Kenobi's mind without even using her force power, just like through his emotions in that moment. Whereas like, she's actually using the force power on Leia and can't figure it out. It's just, it's stupid. It's a plot contravent contravance. Uh, that this 10 year old girl is somehow stronger than, Haja Estri and Obi-Wan Kenobi. Just stupid. 
Um, as Kenobi and Tala arrive on Nor, Tala gives him a pep talk uh, as he struggles to use the Force to bring a small object to him. Again, reinforcing this idea that Kenobi sucks uh, in this show. Uh, when they eventually arrive, Tala has to go through a checkpoint and dresses down a uh, fellow Imperial who is not going to give her access when she's in the wrong uh, sector. So, like, she tries to show up, get through this checkpoint. This guy's like, no, you're, you shouldn't be here. You, you're not... Uh, assigned to this sector, like, peace out. Uh, Kenobi, who knows where he is at this point. Uh, we don't know as an audience. We find out later that he's somehow, like, swimming underwater. Uh, so apparently she dropped him off somewhere. Um, and, and he's, like, swimming. And we'll, we'll see why that's utterly ridiculous in a second here. But back to this, uh, her getting through this checkpoint. Despite his orders, this the security guard's orders seemingly being that he doesn't let people in who are from the wrong sector. Her tongue lashing changes his mind, and he lets her through. That's right, she just lectures this guy, kind of puts him down. Uh, one would think this lead security officer has rejected other higher-ranking officers than him, but it gives Lucasfilm an opportunity to have a female lecture a male, and they take advantage of it. I think that's the only reason why this, and I'm sure some people will try and uh, hand wave it away and be like, oh, well, she's... She's an, uh, she's an officer lecturing uh, her subordinate, of course. Well, like, no, this guy's clearly in charge of this. He has this job. He says that she can't go in because she's not assigned to this sector, seemingly implying he has already uh, told other superior officers that they are not allowed in, yet because she lectures him, uh, she uh, he lets her he lets her through. Uh, I, just, I don't buy it. doesn't really make sense. I'm sure people will be cheering about the lecture on Twitter. Uh, so after she gets into the base, uh, the Tala show really takes over. And this is why it really is the Tala show. I mean, it kind of really starts there with the lecture. Um, and from the, it, the show just kind of just, just dive bombs uh, from there. If it wasn't already pretty, pretty bad uh, and becomes completely and utterly ridiculous. She's communicating with Kenobi right next to a bunch of other Imperials and no one bats an eye. I mean, she's literally sitting at a desk with a comm device talking to Kenobi in like hushed whispers while a guy literally maybe just two desks over is just sitting there like he can't hear her. I mean, come on. I mean, anyone who sat in a cubicle knows you can hear people even with like the walls, even if they're two cubicles over. You can hear them. No, I don't buy it. No one should buy it. It's just utterly, stupidly ridiculous. And then on top of this, she is able to track Kenobi through the uh, computer systems on the base. So apparently she's able to see them through the base and no one else notices there's this dude swimming in the water outside the base and that he's going through an entry port. Like, come on. I mean, she literally tells him, Ben, I'm overriding an entry port. It should be right ahead of you. If she notices Kenobi on some kind of scanner, other Imperials must certainly have noticed. They, they don't, so you have to suspend your disbelief again. I mean, what are we up to? Three or four now? Might even be five. Might even be more, because these are the only ones I've mentioned in this review. So uh, he does finally get in to the base, and then I think there's a huge missed opportunity here, even for nostalgia's sake. Uh, but we will find out why he <laughs> doesn't do this, because Tal has to give him a, the suggestion to do it later on. Again, showing that Kenobi's an idiot. Uh, so, uh, he, he takes out a stormtrooper who's like kind of guarding this entrance. And then instead of like putting on the suit to aid him in his infiltration mission, he just walks around the base in regular clothes. And it's just, it's just so dumb. I mean, you remember the original Star Wars at least literally had them putting on the stormtrooper suits so they could move around within an Imperial base. I mean, Kenobi's just like sneaking around and like, yeah, I know he snuck around, uh, in his Jedi, uh, garb, uh, in the original film as well. But he also wasn't like, like he was being super stealthy and not being noticed whatsoever. Uh, whereas like this one, he's just kind of like walking in the middle of of uh, the hallways and stuff like that. And like you had Luke and Han actually dressed as stormtroopers and they clearly were creating an actual distraction where they're attacking the jail cell where Leia is thanks to R2-D2 figuring out where it was. Uh, and Tala does eventually figure out where they're holding Leia in some sec in a secure area of the base. She doesn't tell him exactly where, though. Whereas, like, R2-D2, they literally, like, gives him the cell block. So this is a huge difference between the original uh, film and how, like, tight its storytelling was and, and in this episode here. Uh, the idea that Tala is able to track Kenobi via her station is again confirmed when he informs her a seeker droid is, is in it is in his path, and she tells him, I see it. So she's clearly can see where he is, and then also 
uh, what's in front of him and what else is on the map. And she says, like, there's all, all these other kinds of seeker droids, too. So kind of adding that complexity to the mission, which, again, they probably should have known if they had any kind of planning take place. Uh, so, however, uh, they do kind of address the fact that she's sitting there talking uh, to this guy, this random person, this comm device. Uh, and another Imperial is like, you don't belong here. This isn't your station. Um, and then that's resolved by her literally just like going behind a stack of like computers <laughs> or servers or whatever. Hard to tell what it is. It looks like a stack of servers and just like like snapping his neck. Um, it's just like you, there's like a literally, uh, like here, you can see it right here, terminal officer grunting. And this is like, there's the, the, op, the, the desks are literally like just a couple feet away from this. Like, so if people turned around, they would be able, uh, to see this. And she's just like killing this guy here. People, you can hear it, like the grunt. He's like grunting. His mouth is open here. He could be shouting right before, uh, she snaps his neck, but it doesn't happen. It's just so contrived. Uh, just so she can try and like stay, um, uh, have her cover, stay undercover. While Tala is killing the officer, Kenobi is able to escape a pair of patrolling stormtroopers using the force uh, to create a distraction. Remember uh, how he was like able to make a noise in the original film? Well, he does that here. Uh, so somehow his force powers have uh, greatly recovered in the time since he was on the ship arriving on the planet. Uh, I guess they've just magically returned due to the desperate nature of the mission. Uh, again, I, I've talked about this before. Disney Star Wars has no idea how the Force works. So this is just another piece of evidence of that. There is an interesting scene, and this is probably one of the more positive scenes to it or intriguing scenes. I'm sure they'll like, I'm sure they'll ruin it in some way, but uh, we get to this part where Kenobi's kind of exploring the base and they kind of come to this room where there's all of these people like petrified. Um, unclear what it is. Kenobi describes it as a tomb. So you assume that these people are all dead. I didn't really recognize any of the characters except for this one. Looks like a youngling um, from uh, Revenge of the Sith. And then obviously from the first episode, they were kind of in this uh, this garb. Uh, but I didn't really, uh, maybe they're all supposed to be force sensitive people could be, uh, their trophies that Vader's keeping from his various missions. I'm not sure why he would be keeping them in there. Maybe these are like inquisitors, um, mission. I, I like, I really don't know who knows what this is. You don't know. We never find out before. Like we can find out more about it. Um, uh, Leia is finally, uh, Reva's finally lost her patience with Leia and is now putting her into some kind of, like, torture device. Uh, who knows what's going to happen to her? Like, I guess there's an implication that she's going to become petrified like this, but you don't know. They don't tell us what's happening to her. Leia's always asking. Reva's like, you better tell me. And there's, like, stuff coming to, like, get her head or something. Maybe they're going to do a lobotomy on her. It's unclear. Uh, and then, like, I guess Kenobi hears Leia calling out through the fort. It's unclear. Like, it could be just him hearing her shouting, which, like he's able to figure out where she is at that point. Cause he still has no idea where she is or, or it's through the force and then he's still figuring out where she is through the force that way. Uh, and then, so he, he radios to Tala and is like, I need a distraction. Give me a distraction. And <laughs> this is so stupid. Remember the distraction, in the original star Wars is literally Han and Leia going to rest or uh, Han and Luke going to rescue Leia and, and attacking the, um, uh, cell block, the prison, the detention block. Well, Tala's solution is literally to report to Reva about the path. So Reva decides to stop torturing Leia just as the device is about to approach her because an officer <laughs> arrives in the room and says, I was told it cannot wait. At this point, Reva does not know it's Tala or what the interruption is or even who is summoning her, but she stops everything she's doing. Like this is another moment where you have to like just suspend your disbelief and buy it. Um, and instead of like the, like the main thing that she's trying to do here, her whole like mission to find Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, she just stops it because this officer says, it, you know, I was told it cannot wait. She doesn't ask like who's asking for her. Doesn't ask any information from this officer, like nothing just stops what she's doing and goes because this person said it. It's just absolutely garbage, atrocious writing. Um, so then it's revealed that Tala is the one who's summoned Reva to report on the path. 
She informs her the network is running out of Florum and how they are operating. She even says that's kind of probably where Kenobi is. Instead of instead of Reva using her mind suck powers, uh, Reva lectures Tala about the path having spies embedded within the Empire. Again, like it doesn't make sense. If you're going to give someone these like mind suck powers, they're not going to sit there and like have a dialogue with someone that they suspect is a traitor or is lying to them. They're just going to go out and use this. I mean, we saw what she did on Tatooine. Why would she not do it to this Imperial officer she suspects to be a traitor and is lying to her? Nevertheless, that's what happens. Um, so while Tala is telling her yarn to Reva, Kenobi does his best Batman Cutting the power to the room where Leia is being held and then hacking down two stormtroopers under the cover of darkness. I, it was just, I just thought it was like utterly ridiculous. It was, it was ridiculous. I mean, he kills the first one. You can hear the lightsaber cutting through the guy. The other guy doesn't even like radio in or anything. And there's like a, there is a significant time lapse between him killing the first guy and killing the second stormtrooper. And I, it was, I mean, it, it was stupid. But moving on, uh, his decision to not put on the Stormtrooper suit comes back to bite him. So he does. He eventually does rescue Leia. He kills the two Stormtroopers, rescues Leia, and then they're, they're trying to escape. Uh, and then his decision to not put on the Stormtrooper suit comes back to bite him. As a secret droid identifies him, the entire ba- base begins to converge on his position. A base-wide alarm goes off, and an officer informs Reva that Kenobi is um, is, is on the base, is in the base. Uh, literally says it's him, because uh, the secret droid has like, clearly identified that it's, that it's Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, this is just after Tala told her Kenobi is on Florum. Instead of killing her there on the spot for clearly lying, Reva turns and goes to pursue Kenobi while uh, assigning two stormtroopers to escort Tala to interrogation. Um, As they're about to escort her off, um, Kenobi contacts her, and the stormtroopers are all blustered. Like, oh, this person's actually a spy. I can't believe it, even though they were just standing there when she was lying to Reva. Um, So she then, like, beats beats these stormtroopers up, steals one one blaster, and then blasts them both, gunning them down. Uh, of course, right? Of course she does. She's able to outsmart Reva. Uh, timing, she's able to like escape the stormtroopers. I mean, she just, she's doing it all here. This is why it's called the Tala Show. As the stormtroopers por- pursue Kenobi, we get to see him use his lightsaber to deflect blaster bolts. This is probably one of the few highlights of the episode. I actually kind of enjoyed that part. Um, however, it, it quickly, quickly turns because there's like a moment where he literally just like, he blocks, a, he deflects a bolt, turns around, looks, completely turns around, looks to see if it hit the target, and then turns back around. And while he was turned around, there's literally like a squad of stormtroopers shooting at him. Like he just completely exposed his back. Uh, So I just thought that was just kind of ridiculous. And it's very obvious that he does that too. Um, And then, and then this, like, there's this whole, like the way this kind of scene ends is that while he was fighting off the stormtroopers, one of the bolts hit into the, this window here that you can see and creates a crack in the water. The pressure is starting to kind of seep through. Um, the stormtroopers are held at bay because he deflects a bolt into a blast door, blocks them out. And the stormtroopers are trying to get it open. And then Kenobi is trying to use the force. Tala shows up before Reva surprise. And then despite leaving after her and then, um, she gets to Leia. They go out. They go a little bit. Kenobi just stands here trying to like stop the water from coming in. I, who, I don't understand why. Uh, and at the end, it, they never explain it because he literally like lets it go through and then whacks another blast door that stops the water from getting to him and like floods out all the stormtroopers right after they broke in. So I guess they just wanted that like dramatic scene where the stormtroopers are getting washed out by the flood i don't know it's just but it doesn't make any sense because he's literally there trying to like stop the flood i don't know it's stupid uh but again that's to be expected now from this show uh and then um kenobi finally decides to put on a disguise uh, at the behest of tala of course tala has to has to to suggest it Uh, Because Kenobi's an idiot and would never think of doing that himself, despite a little Clone Wars episode where he completely goes under like facial recognition surgery uh, to become a completely different person to infiltrate uh, a prison on Coruscant uh, to try and get some information out of uh, a prisoner that's being held there. 
Uh, I'm at, I was actually surprised Leia doesn't talk or run away uh, at this point. I mean, she's pretty much been doing that every single episode. This time, she just literally stays quiet and hides underneath Kenobi's coat. It's quite surprising. I'm surprised she didn't just charge off and run through the base herself because uh, that's kind of what she's been doing the other episodes. Uh, and then I remember I told you uh, we would find out what the other two Inquisitors were doing the entire time. Well, they finally show up uh, with the fifth brother ordering the base shut down. I mean, how many times are we going to shut down the base and shut down the port before we realize it absolutely does nothing because um, the writers are able to write around it. Um, so I, I thought this was, I thought this was kind of witty. I wrote, Shutting down a base report has worked out so well over the past three episodes. Surely it will work this time. Surely, surely. Uh, so as they're, as a uh, Kenobi, Tala and Leia, I've finally got out into the hangar. They're almost about to board a ship. Reva shows up and yells traitor at Tala. It's like, why would you give it up over an old man and this kid? Like yada, yada, yada. Um, and so like, it looks like, looks like all hope is lost. Reva's got him cornered. They're surrounded by all these stormtroopers and Imperials, but lo and behold, Wade and Sully show up in their T-47s that were supposed to be only used for <laughs> for trash. And they blast the hangar to bits, sending the Imperials running. Again, it's another moment where you have to suspend your disbelief that the Imperials were so flustered by Kenobi that they didn't notice these two ships or the carrier hauling them enter the system and approach their base. Not only do you have to believe the Imperials are so flustered, but Wade and Sully know just when to show up in order to give... Uh, Kenobi, Tala, and Leia are right out. The timing is impeccable. How did they hit it at the exact time? Oh my gosh, how did they do it? Man, amazing. Without ever communicating with Tala that this was even happening. Man, this is so brilliant. Such brilliant writing here. Man, perfect timing. These guys, these guys just know the Force must have spoken to them. No, it's utterly ridiculous, stupid. Doesn't make any sense. It's not explained. It's literally a scenario that they created to try and get them out of this other scenario, but it doesn't make any sense. Like you needed to foreshadow this. It needed to be kind of set up. And I guess you can argue, yeah, he mentioned the uh, T-47s earlier, but like there was, these guys like shut it down. They were <laughs> going to do it. They didn't even want to help him. Like they like basically rejected helping you. So like they only, they only gave you information. That was it. Um, so eventually they escape. Um, Wade is, is, is killed. Of course, the, the, the male gets killed um, by Reva. Um, as he's trying to shoot her with the spaceship, she's like literally standing here deflecting it. Uh, I guess they were trying to go for like some of that Starkiller stuff from the video game. Uh, I was never a huge fan of, fan of that just because of how uh, ridiculous it is. And I know they've put it in the comics and some of it can be kind of cool where like Vader's literally like crushing um, spaceships within space. But again, that contradicts the whole idea of the first episode. Like, why wasn't he doing that in <laughs> in the original Star Wars when he's uh, hunting down the rebels? Instead, he's actually shooting them um, with his, his TIE fighter. Uh, they do escape, but this escape is all part of Reva's plan. Uh, and she reveals to Darth Vader, who's like, I'm done with you. I'm about to kill you because he's failed her. I don't even understand why he, I think I talked about this a little bit earlier, but I don't understand why he's even like letting her run the show. Like he showed up on Mapuzo. He should be running the show now. He should have been taking over. They should have been following his instructions. She should be in charge. He should have been the one figuring out what was going on with the interrogation of Leia, but you can't have that because then he clearly figures out that Leia is his daughter. Like, so again, they've just tied themselves into these knots that none of it really makes any sense. Uh, and they just have to keep going on with it. And it's just going to get worse and worse from here. And there's no like in show continuity and episode continuity in universe continuity. Cause they've just thrown that whole idea out the window, despite professing to uh, be um, tied to that continuity. It's all just, it's all just uh just, so, just words and the actions don't match the words. Uh, and then it also like, I don't really buy the explanation that she would uh, let them go on purpose because she has this tracking device and she wants to like now finally fi hunt down this like rebel cell. Um, because throughout the show, Reva's characterization has been, it's all about Kenobi. Even, she even kind of says that to, um, I think she mentions that in the beginning of this episode, it's all about Kenobi um, or she mentioned it last episode when she was talking to Vader. It's all about Kenobi. 
Um, so I it just it doesn't really make any sense. She's been obsessed with Kenobi from the very beginning. I mean, even with her discussion with the Grand Inquisitor in the first episode, um, to now let's just let him go. Uh, when she's clearly has him in her grasp, she could have like they wouldn't let them get out of the system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I just don't. I don't think she would have done that. She's not that type of character. We haven't seen her kind of doing any of these uh, conniving things. I guess aside from kidnapping Leia to try and bait Kenobi out. Um, but that's, she hasn't like kind of done anything like this before. And I just don't buy that. She would do that. She would, once she had Kenobi, she would not let him escape. So to, to conclude, Obi-Wan Kenobi part four has an interesting premise an infiltration and rescue mission akin to something like mission impossible. Like, I think that is actually uh, an interesting premise. I mean, Top Gun Maverick is like that. The mission impossible films are like that. Like there's lots of uh, good movies that are about rescuing someone or, and doing an infiltration uh, mission. And, and those are fun and exciting. I mean, you can just look at the kind of original Ocean's Eleven film, uh, even the remake. Uh, they're fun um, and they, they can be quite entertaining. So there's not, like that premise is, is interesting. However, uh, every single Mission Impossible film is vastly superior and makes far more sense than anything you will see in Obi-Wan Kenobi Part 4. Uh, this episode continues the numerous characterization problems the show has had with Obi-Wan Kenobi, but also adds Reva into the mix. Tala is a wonder character solving all the problems that Kenobi faces. Uh, and then the plot controversies, controversies are also just like, they're so in your face. You like can't ignore them. Uh, and, and it's really hard to suspend your disbelief to kind of uh, justify them. And then on the, on the positive side, Kenobi fending off Imperials was slightly entertaining and the mystery of the seemingly dead bodies was intriguing as well. So I gave the show uh, a three. Uh, I guess that's probably being generous. I gave the last episode a one. This is what I gave the first episode. Um, and uh, for the most part, I think that's probably pretty accurate. Um, but it just it wasn't very good. I don't recommend watching it. I don't recommend watching any of the show. Uh, and I don't expect it to get any better. It's, uh, if the leaks are to be true, which they've pretty much been true up to this point show is going to get a lot, lot worse. So those are my thoughts on Obi-Wan Kenobi part four. Let me know what you think. My name is John Trent.